I think it would be useful. It's okay. it's a really it's a very mixed group at this conference. Okay. Good. Does not works for me. Miranda, I shared a link to the formal land acknowledgement for Boulder in the chat with you. Thank you. I'm going to use the system one okay. and just a piece of it that I pulled out. The full piece thing is it. really long. <laughs> Are you back home, Miranda, in Colorado, or are you still? I am. Yeah, it was, it was magical to be in Canada. It was great. I felt <laughs> such a relief to be with my parents. Yeah. And it was perfect weather the entire time. Of course, as mm -hmm. you know, Vancouver Island is desperate for rain. Michael, just confirming you're playing our PowerPoint. Michael. <laughs> Sorry, I had, to, I had to run and get my charger from the other room. What did you say? Oh, uh, confirming you're playing our PowerPoint or am I? Um, I am happy to do that. Uh, thank you for such an honor. Um, I can do it too. I have it ready to go, but. Oh, if you have it ready to go, let go ahead, knock your sock. Okay. okay. All righty, it's 1130. We have currently 12 in the waiting room <laughs> and we'll just see how many join. And when it comes time to go to the breakout rooms, uh, you guys can let me know if I need to delete any rooms. We'll see how many participants we have. That sounds good. All right, it's time for me to stop sharing and then it, it, this is interesting. I'm supposed to share these um, sponsors, but no one can see them until I let them in first. Cool. All right, I'm letting the waiting room in right now. And I'll stop sharing. Go ahead and share our screen. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm jumping out. You guys are on your own. All right. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today we're going to be um, this afternoon. We are all going to be talking to you today about recognizing open educational resource or open educational practices and resources in promotion and tenure. So you're welcome to follow along with this presentation. Um, actually, we'd love for you to go there as it is. So at www.menti.com and you can use the code 89324455. If, you guys, if uh, somebody from the group here would like to put that in the chat, that would be really helpful. Let me see if I can try, sorry, trying to just go to the next slide here. All right, so who are we? Um, so uh, my name is Amanda Coolidge. I am the Director of Open Education at BC Campus, which is located in British Columbia, Canada. I am currently presenting today from the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, um, which is the land of the uh, Ebequet people. And that is in Prince Edward Island, Canada. And I'll pass it to Marinda. Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Marinda McClure. I'm Health and Human Sciences Librarian at the University of Colorado Boulder and one of our three OER leads. And on behalf of us all, uh, who the remaining presenters are in Colorado at the University of Colorado's four campuses. And we honor and acknowledge that these four campuses are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, Comanche, Cayunwa, Inkota, uh, Pueblo, Shoshone nations. Um, we also want to acknowledge that the 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now Colorado. 
Perfect. And pardon me, I mispronounced mm -hmm. one of the nations. So Lakota was a misnomer. Thank you. Thanks, Miranda. And um, perhaps we could just go down the list here and everyone could just introduce themselves in which um, university you're representing. Okay, hi, my name is Ben Harnke. I'm an education and research informationist at the uh, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus Library, the Strauss Health Sciences Library. And I'm Carolyn Sinkinson from the University of Colorado at Boulder Libraries, and I am also um, one of the library's OER leads and work in the teaching and learning department. Hi, I'm Leslie Reynolds. I'm the senior associate dean at the University of Colorado Boulder Libraries. Uh, happy to be here today. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Cantrell. I'm the scholarly communication librarian at the University Libraries with the University of Colorado Boulder and also with the Center for Research Data and Digital Scholarship. And I'm the third OER leads. Michael, I think you're up. Hi everybody, I'm Michael Lampy. I'm uh, from the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus as well, serving the School of Pharmacy as the Senior Instructional Designer. I am also uh, the Contracted Instructional Designer for the OER Committee at the Anschutz Medical Campus OER Committee. Welcome to have you everybody. So um, I just wanted to say that it's been such a pleasure getting to collaborate um, and work with uh, everyone who is on the panel today and who's going to be working through this workshop. It's been a real honor to work with each of you. And um, I have to say, at one of these points, I'd love to meet you all face to face um, so we can have a coffee together and kind of just give each other some actual high fives instead of virtual high fives. Okay, so one of the things you'll notice um, is we did go ahead and uh, do some land acknowledgements in the beginning. And um, if you were at uh, my talk this morning, I did also highlight this particular uh, website. It's native-lands.ca. And that will also give you some information about which land you're situated on. Um, and you can take a look at that. So if you can all go to menti.com, um, once again, use the code um, that's uh, currently posted above. Um, it is 89324455. And we would love to get a bit of a feel for um, who is attending today and what is your role at the institution. So obviously we put some on here, but if, if you don't uh, reflect some of those, please uh, change that. And. Uh, you need the link again, it is menti.com and you should be able to put the code in 89324455. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. We've got a fair amount of educators, librarians, administrators, other. Great, educational technologists. And for those of you who are um, selecting other, if you don't mind um, sharing in the chat um, specifically, what is your role um, that we aren't capturing? Um, if you're, if you feel um, okay to do that. All right. Assistive technology assistant. I primarily write, write quick start guides and remediate documents for accessibility. That's awesome, Dustin. Thank you for joining us. And a program manager for a learning center and manage 22 tutors. Thank you, Susan. Okay, uh, interior design instructor online. It's great. I bet that has really changed things um, for the interior design world this year. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep, uh, I'm gonna go through the screen here and then um, please feel free to keep chatting on there. 
So one of the things um, that I did want to bring your, to your attention is um, before we begin talking about tenure and promotion and how open educational resources are either reflected or not reflected in tenure and promotion is to give a bit of a definition of open educational resources. And um, one of the uh, UNESCO um, defines open educational resources as learning, teaching, and research resources that are available in any format and medium that are in the public domain or are under a copyright that has been released under an open license, which allows one to uh, have no cost access to reuse, repurpose, adapt, and redistribute. Um, the materials. And a lot of these OERs can be a variety of things. They could be textbooks, videos, course materials, lesson plans, games, simulations, wikis, blogs, test banks, PowerPoints, anything that would be considered an open educational resource as long as it's in the public domain or it has no most important thing. So another thing that I shared this morning, but I'll reiterate once again, is that there's these five R's that allow um, you to, uh, they're, they're basically five rights for open educational resources. So the first right is to retain. So that is to make, own, and control copies of the content. So for example, if you're a student, um, you actually will be able to retain access to your textbook, for example, long after access has ended. Another R, the second R, which is reuse, is the right to use the content in a wide range of ways. Um, and this presentation is CC BY, and I mentioned this this morning as well, is that basically you can take this presentation and uh, because it allows for reuse, you can do this presentation um, tomorrow exactly as it is. Um, the third R is revise, so it's the right to adapt, adjust, or modify, or alter the content itself. So if there is an open educational resource that you'd like to use in your classroom, but there's a few chapters or like modules that you don't want, and some of that information is out of date, you can make those changes. The fourth uh, R is remix. It's the right to combine the original or revised content with other material to create something new. And um, the final one is redistribute. So the right to share copies of the original content with others. And the five R's are all enabled by open licenses. So open licenses in a, uh, make it possible for a creator of the work to give everyone and everywhere uh, permission to use, share, edit, and redistribute all of all or part of your work um, without needing to ask first. So the way um, I'll give a little another bit of historical background here is that um, while I work for BC Campus, BC Campus is also a member of a collaborative that recently started up, and the collaborative is called Doers. Um, DOER stands for Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success. And it's a collaborative of a group of 25 public higher education systems that are both statewide and province-wide organizations. And they're committed to um, supporting student success by promoting free customizable OER. It was launched in 2018 and DOERS helps member organizations implement scale and sustain OER by advancing research and policy, sharing tools and learnings, and showing how OER can foster equity and student success. So together, the entire um, collaborative serves over 6 million students at over 680 colleges and universities. So I'm in that um, this particular collaborative, and as part of that collaborative, we're broken up into a variety of working groups. And one of those working groups that I currently work on is called the Capacity, the Building Capacity Work Group. There's a couple of projects that have come out of that particular working group. One is a project based on bookstores. So looking at um, conversations to be having with your bookstores and, and how to mediate that. And the other conversation was something we wanted to have around tenure and promotion. And specifically the ability to recognize um, open educational resources and open educational practices within one's tenure and promotion portfolio. So this was a collaboration that I engaged in with Andrew McKinney from um, CUNY, which is the City University New York system, 
myself and a consultant named Deep Shinoy. So one of the first things that I wanted to know was really where did tenure in the academy actually come from? Because to me, understanding the history of it makes sort of the, the case for me personally to better understand um, why has open not been a part of tenure and promotion and how can it become a part of tenure and promotion? So tenure in the academy was actually first articulated in the 1940s statement of principles on academic and freedom and tenure. The overall purpose of tenure is to ensure academic freedom and to provide enough economic security to make the profession attractive. One thing we learned, um, so we did this bit of a history and then Andrew um, McKinney and I went through and we took a look at a number of different tenure and promotion processes. And um, in those processes, we noticed that the tenure and promotion um, varies greatly from institution to institution. And that when it does vary that much, um, it becomes hard to sort of come up with a framework or an idea of, of ways that people can put open into, um, into tenure and promotion because each institution basically has its own culture and we wanted to map that out. So one major challenge, I just wanna make sure it's right. One of the major challenges that's faced by open educational resource and textbook affordability incentive programs is actually recruiting interested faculty. Um, and the, the hard part there is what happens there is we need to really determine how to best support and reward the considerable work um, that's involved in using this, these um, and adopting these course materials. So James Skidmore of the University of Waterloo recommended that um, institutions recognize the creation of open educational resources in the tenure and promotion process. He says that doing so would communicate clearly that institutions of higher education take seriously the responsibility to tailor knowledge to students and to reduce barriers. So we also want to know a little bit about um, when you saw the topic of this converse or this workshop, what actually made it an interest to you? What brought you to the session today? Um, so if you can go back into menti.com, again, use the code 89324455. We'd love to know um, if you could share with us what you have done there and what brought you to this session. So we see someone has a general interest in OER, improve advocacy for the value of OE work. And I think, and I wanna learn more about OER and what it is, okay. Looking for ways to advocate for OER with faculty. Involved in OER creation and I care about recognition of this work and the advocacy of value of the work. I'm interested in writing a OER textbook and hope to learn whether such act is a value in higher education. Individual faculty members on my campus are interested in how we can get this recognition. Former instructor working with future instructors. I wanna hear about UBC's yeah, initiatives to weave OER. We'll talk about that in a little bit for sure. Interested in understanding how OER development is valued by institutions. Thank you. This is great. And I think, you know, one of the, it's great to see what, what's brought people to the session as the facilitators will all agree is, you know, a lot of this work really is how do we, how do we continue to advocate for open educational resources, but also how do we help instructors um, show value of this work so that it's no longer off the side of one's desk, um, but it's actually on the desk and it's being recognized as something important um, and valuable. Okay, so um, the facilitators and I have gone through um, quite 
uh, a process of breakout rooms. <laughs> and what we are trying to, what we're going to do here, I'm going to stop sharing right now, is we have, we are going to split you all into various breakout rooms. And we are going to, um, okay, we will have five breakout rooms. Thanks, Ben. So we would love for you to uh, check out the Google document that we have here. And if you, in about two minutes or a minute here, um, our wonderful session host is going to put us into breakout rooms and um, we will go ahead and um, start having a little bit more discussion about um, recognizing OEP and then we will come back to the room in um, five to seven minutes. So we'll see if we can facilitators if we can pay attention to the timing of that would be really helpful. Okay, and since we have um, 13 participants, I did drop that down to four rooms. So we have at least three in each room. So I will open the rooms right now. Right, so since I was going to be room six, I'll just join another group. That's my plan. Yeah, pick a number.
Okay. Everyone should be back in about 30 seconds. Okay. It is incredibly nerve wracking when you close that because you're just like, am I going to lose everybody or are they just going to somehow transfer through cyberspace? Fortunately, they, they transferred. They get 60 seconds to return. Okay. Um, and so some will some will wait to the last second and and some will leave, leave their room immediately and come back. So I'm going to try and, and keep an eye on the time that we said we were going to do since okay. we have fewer breakout rooms than we thought we were going to have. I can okay. I can be timekeeper. That'd be great. Thank you so much. OK, people are coming back. Excellent. Loved. <laughs> I was saying to my group, I get a little bit nervous when I you know, when you see that where you're just like, oh my gosh, we've all gone and now we're coming back. So um, let me know when we've got everybody, if somebody can maybe from the facilitators, just, you know, we're getting a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Well, I hope everybody had a really good first discussion. I know our group did. Um, so what we're gonna do now is report back and um, we're gonna ask um, if you can go to menti.com, um, use the code, actually, I was going to do this. Sorry. So I'm actually going to be the recorder for this. And um, if I can get out of my, anyway, I'll try over here. Um, if you can, uh, we'll go with group one. Group one, do you want to report back on? Sure. We had a, a, a really great conversation. There are a variety of people from a variety of different roles in the conversation um, with varying degrees of awareness and, and knowledge about OER. However, many and most in the room, even if they hadn't yet named it OER, had been doing that work out of a, a, a labor of love. And so that was a topic that came up quite a bit, is that for many, this work we do in open education is invisible labor that isn't uh, readily uh, recognized in the ways that are valued within the institution. And so then we started to talk more about one the need for learning opportunities so more people would have the language to name the work they were doing um, the idea of new and inventive incentive structures through grants course releases uh, graduate students undergraduate research assistants were some of the ideas shared um, and then Primarily, I think the overarching theme was to shift the culture and move that um, work of open education as of as an invisible labor to something that is uh, is clearly valued if the institution indeed uh, states that it is of value to that group. Did I miss anything? Um, I'm just thinking. Wow, well done. Way to go! I was in group one, um, so. I'm just going to give props to group one there. That was really good feedback. <laughs> um, group two, let's hear from group two. Group two dissolved due to lack of people. So pop over to group three. All right. Um, ben and I were in group three, and I'll kind of report back. Ben, you can fill in since you're the note taker. Um, I think one of the things that was mentioned uh, by everyone in the group was um, the issue of time and uh, the time uh, to to create OER um, and to find OER. And I think tied to that is obviously, um, you know, something um, you're not going to have the time for something if it's not valued um, amongst amongst the faculty uh, or for tenure and promotion. And I think also um, we talked in association with that issue was the funding. Um, is obviously incentives um, are, are huge when it comes to um, using, creating, adopting OER. Uh, and then I think another thing that group one mentioned that we also talked about a bit in our group was this issue of, of the culture within a department and how to find ways um, to begin shifting that culture um, towards, towards valuing OER more. Ben, do you have anything to add? Nope, I have a great summary. Awesome. Well done. That's really great. Uh, did we have a group four? We did. Okay. Yeah, we had a great conversation. I'll share a couple of the points and then turn it over to Michael to share the rest. Um, so a few of the things we came up with in terms of barriers is does it count as peer review? And the idea that traditionally gatekeeping has sort of been um, 
the idea of having a reputable publisher for your work, and there is still concern with working in what might be a self-publishing model, um, which can sometimes be the case for OER. And then another big barrier is time or release time or compensation for the added work and effort. Um, in terms of barriers that we imagine to OER and open education being recognized in TNP, we had a couple points there that one, it just simply hasn't been thought of or done yet, which we know is sort of our impetus for this session today. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in policies and practices on campuses. And then also that uh, this just supports faculty in doing OEP work um, on all kinds of levels. Turn it over to Michael. Uh, I Marina already did a pretty good job of summarizing everything. I would just add the, <clears throat> the, the need to, especially in public institutions where advocacy and, and need to uh, lower the financial uh, you know, issues relating to students, especially with uh, low SES, uh, being able to advocate. And once there's a critical mass, usually in higher education is trying to break down some of those uh, legacy policies that are historical at universities. Uh, and then also just breaking down the barriers of, when things are changed and adapted, how can we weed out unethical use of OER? Uh, I've always thought that using blockchain technology would help track adaptation efforts while leaving the integrity of uh, the decentralization of, of OER materials and, 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 and the movement there. So that, that's kind of the other two points, but everything else was covered perfectly. I was muted, sorry. Um, excellent, thank you so much. Uh, did we have another group? So that was all of our groups. Yeah, just those three. Perfect. So as you can see here, I have um, the recording. I was typing in there all of the work that was happening. Um, and so this, this Mentimeter particular document will actually be available for all of you post events. So if you're interested in sort of like taking a look at, oh yeah, what were those barriers we were talking about? And this will always be available. Okay, I'm gonna continue on here and go to present again. All right. So someone actually brought up this question about really having an interest in what did the University of British Columbia do in particular related to bringing in open education uh, work as uh, part of the tenure and promotion process. So um, one institution in Canada has done that, that is the University of British Columbia. So the story behind this is really interesting and something that um, it might be a really a uh, good advocacy role for your student union organizations, which, by the way, there were a few presenting yesterday asking questions to um, the congressman, and clearly the students are very, um, very much in, in uh, positive enforcement for open education resources. So this is a story that you can take back to them. So what happened was, is I was having conversations with the students union about um, at the University of British Columbia about how, you know, how do you get faculty interested in open educational resources. So we talked a lot about different advocacy strategies and we went back and forth about a few things and one thing that I really wanted to reiterate to the students is that nothing is going to work if you force or make instructors feel bad for not using open educational resources. And so if you start putting out some sort of mandated um, you know, statement about you know, students mandate that um, instructors use OER, it's not really the point. What we're still trying to do is practice you know, academic freedom and to be able to allow for instructors to make choice. So one of the things that, um, that the, that the students union decided to do was called a listening tour. So what they did is they went around to different departments and they asked department heads as well as instructors if they wouldn't mind sitting down with them to sort of go over a few questions about OER. And they took this really lovely kind of coaching um, listening approach where they just asked questions to instructors. Are you using OER? What type of OER do you use? Do you believe in free resources for students? And then they asked the number one question. Why aren't you using open educational resources? Why are you not engaged in this work? And what came back 90% of the time is that the instructor said, I don't use open educational resources, nor do I create, sorry, just a second, the dog at this, my aunt's house just jumped up onto the oven. 
Hold on. Can you get down? Okay. Okay. We're fine. I'm fine. Okay. So um, the students, um, right. So the students asked this question time and again, the instructor said, um, OER, the creation of OER, the adaptation of OER do not, does not count towards my promotion and tenure, and therefore I don't put my energy into that. So the students came back and they um, had a conversation with me, but they also had a conversation with their, the director of teaching and learning, and they also had a conversation with administrators, some administrators who were pro open educational resources. And so they said, how do we get open educational resources into the tenure and promotion process? So they worked with these administrators a bit back and forth. And what they were able to do was to find a section within the, um, so they found a section within the tenure and promotion process under educational leadership, where they were able to add this statement. And the statement is um, contributions to the practice and theory of teaching and learning literature, including publications in peer reviewed and professional journals, conference publications, book chapters, textbooks, and open education repositories and resources. And so this was the very first time that something like this kind of went up to that level. Now, one of the reasons for this success is not because the University of British Columbia is like ahead in the game on this, on all of this work, but it's because the people listen to the students. And when I say people, we're talking about the folks who are sitting at the Senate committees they're sitting at the um, provost office and they're sitting in the president's office because they're, you know, this is the, these are the folks we are working with to improve their education. And so that we want to see ways to do this. So to have a student led initiative was incredibly powerful. And this is something um, that I think would be really powerful for your institutions in Colorado to, um, to consider. I'm just going to keep going here. Okay, so this brings us to the um, to so now that we know that one institution in Canada was able to put in open educational resources into um, a tenure and promotion process. Part of the doers group in that working capacity, the capacity working group I was telling you about, the idea initially was. Um, Andy McKinney and Deep had said to me, you know, can we use the University of British Columbia example to basically um, create sort of like a, a template whereby an, an institution would be able to use this template to implement tenure, an OER policy within their tenure and promotion. And from the get go, we realized that that's not possible. And I mentioned this, you know, a little bit earlier, it's not possible because each institution has its own culture and each institution has its own process for tenure and promotion. And so to create one template just wouldn't be um, possible. However, what we decided to do was to take an advocacy approach. So I'm going to go ahead and I, um, Leslie, I can see your face. I wonder if you could just give me a thumbs up if you can see this particular Okay, so what we decided to do was um, create a matrix. Now, the purpose behind this, as I said, was to take more of an advocacy approach. So the idea there is as an instructor or as a librarian or perhaps as a staff member who are seeking tenure and promotion, what, um, what can you do to put in your particular work that you're doing already that isn't being recognized, but put it into those three areas that are most prominent within the tenure promotion portfolio. Those three areas are research, teaching, and service. So we decided that rather than going ahead and changing policy, we wanted to see um, folks at the institution start to um, recognize for themselves the importance of this work so that they may push the change in policy from the ground up, if that makes sense. So the example here we decided to do was take a look at adopting. So let's say you use an open educational resource in your class, or you're using an open access research journal. Well, what is something that you can do? You could have some evidence here. So we provided examples of evidence that you might choose. And then where would you put this within the portfolio? So we said teaching. Yes. Another one is adaptation. So what is your contribution? Are you revising others' work? Are you remixing to be in alignment? And again, what are some types of evidence you may wish to use? The next one was um, creating, so making new OER. Another one was 
Are you improving learning by increasing student engagement, by providing an innovative method to uh, learning, by reducing student costs? And again, this evidence here is an example um, of a multi-institutional study on the impact of open textbooks. So perhaps that's something that you will you could do um, to start to build up that evidence. Another thing that many of you are doing, um, and you're doing this even by attending this particular workshop, is the start of learning more about uh, how you can take this back to your community. So by mentoring others in OER or disseminating knowledge about OER. And so again, the evidence here that we put forward are things like provide the list of workshops or webinars that you've done in relation to this. Um, and so this continues on as we go through. So our, the hope here is that as you or your faculty members or others that you may be working with um, to who are working on promotion and tenure is perhaps ask them, for example, um, you know, when they start doing this work is to say, have you thought about um, asking for peer reviews on this particular OER on this open educational resource? Have you thought about putting out a, um, a small survey that we could start to use to get some, um, some information on? So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to, oops, oh, not that one, sorry. Gotta find my, okay. So that information about the matrix, the best place to find it um, is, I like to link to this journal, art this article we did um, that was in the uh, NEBI, um, which is the Northeastern Bureau of Higher Education Journal. Um, and I really like passing that on because it does give a little bit of a historical overview and then it does give you the matrix. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna pass it over to Ben and Michael who are going to chat with all of us a little bit more about those metrics that I started talking about. Thanks, Amanda. And I'm gonna share my screen. So you should see um, this PowerPoint slide. So yeah, um, um, this is based on a presentation that Michael, I, and the rest of our Anschutz OER committee have done elsewhere about, okay, you've created some OER, mainly created, but you know, this may apply also to revising or remixing if we go back to the five R's, but you've created this material. How do you start thinking about where it's going to fall into the PNT process, promotion and tenure process? So, so what kind of analytics could you gather? So, um, um, uh, there we go. So, where to find the analytics? Um, as Amanda mentioned, and, and, and it's in her um, grid there, um, kind of the first thing to look for it are opportunities for peer review, um, because that's a powerful, um, a good peer review is a, is a powerful indicator of quality, and a PNT committee probably wants to see that. So um, there's several ways peer review can happen. Um, and for example, with OpenStax, um, peer review uh, happens prior to publication. So um, you're not going to get your material in OpenStax until their editorial board or whomever they have for peer review has a good, you know, takes a look at it, checks for quality and so on. Um, um, and there are no mechanisms for user reviews, for, for user peer review in OpenStax. Um, um, as opposed to the open text library where um, the peer review happens post publication. And you can see that, you know, you can see the name of the person and um, their affiliation. And so something like that could be a powerful, uh, powerful thing to include, include in a PNT um, dossier or packet. Um, and then you kind of have this hybrid like Merlot where um, technically like anyone can pretty much post anything, but the editors may select certain materials to be peer reviewed. Um, and we just had that happen with one of our nursing faculty who um, placed uh, an electronic book. She created a book and just on, on 
you know, on, on their own, they select that book for peer review um, and it got a good review. So, um, and then, um, you know, another kind of repository that may kind of not be on uh, the radar are institutional repositories. We at Anschutz have our own institutional repository, which um, it's not Mountain Scholar now, it's, it's a new platform, but it tracks usage views and things like that. So that's a quick place to get, you know, more concrete metrics, um, clicks. And um, don't forget, um, and also perhaps unknown um, avenue of kind of peer community review or hive review is something called alt metrics, which looks at um, social media mentions, um, social media activity, uh, things like that, that are not captured perhaps in more traditional kind of peer review of journals. So, um, you know, maybe maybe the article got mentioned a lot in Twitter. Uh, like if you did an open access journal article or something and it got mentioned in Twitter a lot, there's lots of Twitter discussion. That's not gonna be captured in normal traditional academic measures of impact. So this is kind of a third party platform that you could consider. And Michael's gonna talk more about some, some of the analytic, analytics type of. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, so uh, in this part, uh, you know, I, I think of OER as a, a disruptor, like you see other technologies being a disruptor. For example, Zoom is a huge disruptor in, in how we do education, especially during the pandemic. And, and why is that important? It's the more that there is some evidence of value that gets associated with something, and typically what we see of value is already given a consistent metric of value. So sometimes I would say there are some OER situations where there's not a formal traditional way of looking at the value of the OER that's being created right now. So how do we do that? So these are some of the more, I, I would say, non-traditional versions of, of capturing the value of your OER content, but doing it in a way where it's going to be hard for uh, somebody, an, an administrator or a leader to say, you know, I can't disagree that somebody is utilizing your content a lot in, in various settings that, again, what Ben said, may not be getting captured in other situations. So here, uh, Google Analytics is uh, one quick way. I know that they, they've, they're they revamping Google Analytics a little bit as we speak, but if you posted your content on a website or on a Google site, for example, this would be a good way of describing, you know, how many people are clicking on it from month to month. Uh, I've done this a couple of times where I was able to see year over year, the change of, of people coming in and, and that kind of provides some indication of, are we providing something useful to the people? I'm gonna do a hands-free next slide that Ben's not helping me with at all here. There we go. <laughs> Ben's actually the one that's controlling it. So I tried to be a magic magician there. Um, so the other thing is, uh, uh, if you might do a video content, uh, we use TextMythnomia at University of Colorado. Uh, so here, uh, you know, this is just a quick intro video that I do for one of my courses. Uh, you know, so that's not a lot of viewers, but let's just say you put a public link to Twitter and all that, and all of a sudden it got, you know, a thousand views or whatever, you know, it's another opportunity to capture that metric so that you could tell your PNT folks, hey, you know, I'm not going to say I'm a big deal, but I'm kind of a big deal type of situation. So uh, go uh, to the next slide. Uh, Twitter is another thing. Uh, Altmetrics uh, does a good job of, of, of doing uh, similar work if you have that subscription to do Altmetrics. Uh, but Twitter actually has some really good metrics as far as which tweets were uh, had most engagements, impressions, things like that. So uh, again, if, if, if your OER goes viral or something to that regard, uh, you know, you could do that. A lot, of, a lot of social media platforms do have some sort of analytics component to it. Uh, next slide, Ben. And then, so last but not least, so you have these different metrics and we talk a lot about being intentional with that. So wherever you place your OER content, think about, hey, is there a particular platform that I'm looking uh, that can give me these type of metrics. So be intentional about before you place it, 
what can you get out of it so that you can promote it not only for the people in the OER world and, and increase the movement, but hey, give credit to yourself that you've done this. So here's a quick example of, of how we would use it in the CV. This, these are all jokingly uh, examples. Uh, ben and I did not publish things on biological concepts. My science teacher would like not be happy with me right now. Uh, but this is kind of one of those things that, you know, did your book get five stars when you, when you submitted it into Merlot? Uh, you know, how much were the views and the analytics so that while it's non-traditional, it starts becoming more of a mainstream. If we all, if we all start doing similar work like this to promote OER in similar fashions, uh, you know, leaders and administrators will have to start looking at it a little bit more carefully. So uh, that is it for me. Ben, do you have any other? Yeah, I just want to mention one other metric that's often lost, and that is if others use your work. That is also a very powerful um, um, piece of evidence for PNT. Like you made and you created an OER textbook, and it's being used at Harvard in their program. That would be a powerful tool or a powerful piece of evidence as well. So not necessarily clicks and so on, and it's harder to track. Um, but if you can figure that out, if others are using or adapting your work, um, put it in there as well. Any questions, concerns, worries? All right, Amanda, we'll send it back to you. Oh, sorry. Great. No, <laughs> so um, it looks like we're going to go back into the next breakout uh, conversation. And Leslie, you were back channeling me about some time. So let me know. Yeah. So I think this the next two breakout rooms will be eight to 10 minutes instead of 15 to 20. <laughs> we are running a little behind and that should help us make it up. OK, sounds good. So we'll see you all back in your breakout rooms uh, shortly. And um, we will see you there. I will open them right now. Thank you.
Okay, once again, we are thrown right back. Um, so um, thank you again for everyone for such a rich discussion. We had a lot going on there. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And this time we're gonna ask a group four to share first. Um, what kind of things did you all talk about? Yeah, we had a, I think a nice discussion about um, the matrix initially when one is looking at it can be a lot of information to absorb and think about and wrap your head around. Um, so Michael had a great idea and I'll let him speak a bit more to it about um, maybe putting the matrix into a learning experience form where um, there would be responsive prompts and questions and suggestions based on what a faculty member or another individual who's doing OEP work inputs into that learning experience. Yeah, no, so, uh, you know, Dustin, uh, Marinda and I all had the conversation of, uh, you know, the matrix is, is very well created. Uh, however, I'm, 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 because I'm an instructional designer and I've had experience showing people the Oscar rubric from Online Learning Consortium, you know, where you have various line items to really keep track on the different aspects of what makes an online course a really good online course. And, and this matrix kind of feels the same way. Uh, I like I like the idea of kind of saying, okay, can we break it down into baby steps for faculty members? Because a lot of times faculty members don't have your typical eight to five job situations when our librarians and instructional designers are typically eight to five type of situations. So is there an asynchronous experience where they just get hit with question one and focus on that one question and say yes or no? And then maybe Miranda pops up on the screen asynchronously saying, oh, you, you're having a hard time doing X, here's what I would do differently. And then afterwards give the contact information of Marinda and then go that route, uh, you know, where it's kind of giving them that kind of scaffolding approach. And then once they become more familiar with what we're trying to get at with them and, and, and expose them to the matrix, uh, it becomes a little bit easier for them to maneuver it and advocate for themselves during the promotion and tenure process. That's awesome. Any other feedback from group four that you want to share? Or? That's where they key points. Okay, great. I love that idea. So get building, Michael. Um, all right, group three. Yeah, I think we just had time to, um, we sort of went through some of the scenarios and we just had time to do the first one for the faculty member. And we talked um, a lot about uh, where this faculty kind of fits into the matrix in terms of um, community advocacy and involvement um, through the OER initiative that they're involved in, um, and also the mentorship and how well that fits in with some of the service components that can be used for tenure and promotion. Um, and also talked about how um, if they're so involved, they're, it's probably obviously um, integrated within their teaching as well. So how important that would be um, to advocate on that level. Um, uh, let's see, Ben, did you wanna say anything about, I, I know uh, we had a little bit of a conversation after that about um, areas that maybe aren't covered by the matrix. Yeah, I, I just uh, mentioned that um, in terms of creation, um, Again, um, adoption of material outside of your institution is a powerful um, piece of evidence for tenure. Like that's, that's demonstrating impact beyond the walls of your institution, which um, they really look for um, for giving tenure. So, so I added that to our matrix. That's great, thank you. Group two, or no, group one. one. Yeah. Um, so I'll go really quickly, um, given our time, but um, I just want to share the story that one of the first things that came up was about tying um, evidence from the matrix and so on to uh, strategic goals and vision and mission statements. And Amanda actually got visibly excited when that comment <laughs> was, was brought up. Um, but we shared the vision and, and mission from the University of Colorado, and immediately you can see words like affordable, transformative, accessible, student success, diversity, and so on. And all of these also present um, really great inserts to advocating for, for OER based on the mission and, and strategic plan 
alignment. So that's one thing we talked about. We also talked about um, how it appealed to folks that there was some flexibility and where you might put things, whether in teaching, uh, research, or service, um, and how that flex flexibility really made it a lot more amenable to different institutions and different settings. I think those were our main points. Thank you. So we have um, six minutes, um, which is remarkable. We really didn't think we'd have all this time. So we're actually probably gonna go ahead and stop the third um, breakout room um, because I think that it's also important if people have uh, general questions that they'd like to ask beforehand, or perhaps if there's any kind of action item uh, from the Colorado facilitators you'd like to see others take on before we end. I was looking at the uh, two matrix JPEGs and wondered if there was a, 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 a version that could be edited. <laughs> yes, um, there is one, sorry. I will, uh, I will get I one. Think, I was oh, thinking we have a department meeting coming up, I think next week, and uh, I thought I'd shoot it to the department chair. And sort of okay, who, out, who in the facilitation is the best person for me to, send that to, um, uh, so you can send it to David or- Yeah, Ben, Ben, you... Ben's a good- Ben, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm Ben's sure he'll send it to me. <laughs> Great. Well, is that is that Google document adoptable and adaptable? <laughs> it's copyrighted, so- Oh. No, he's kidding. Oh, good. Uh, right? <laughs> yes. Come on, Ben. <laughs> All right, yeah, we, I will get you. Um, a better version there. Yeah. Oh, does it have per, does it have downloadable formats? It does. You're right. Oh. Thank you. So if you go to this page um, I mean, yeah, that I, Caroline I mean, yeah. has posted, um, tenure and promotion, you have to scroll to the very bottom, and there's a Word document, a downloadable file, or a PDF. Yep, I see it. Yep. So want the Word document? Yeah. <laughs> Um, would anybody from the facilitation team like to answer Nicole's question? How does professional development fit into the matrix? As many things OER work can fall into that as well. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Oops. Professional development. Mm -hmm. I, Do you mean taking it or providing it? I'm a little confused by the question. I think taking it is probably the question. Uh, this is sort of an ongoing issue. It feels like that that professional development, like where does that fall under the typical um, research teaching service breakdown? You know, learning about about OER, doing something like this conference. You know, where we're learning about things that that relate to OER, and then that's like an intermediate step that never gets reflected on these. Well, it, types it of shows things. up with us. It shows up in our annual review document. Um, you know, how many things we've gone to that are professional development. But I think as far as the CV is concerned, um, if you're receiving professional development, then for the CV, you actually would show output that you developed after going to a workshop or a presentation. So it doesn't, <laughs> going to the present, uh, the, the workshop doesn't count on a CV, but producing something from going to the workshop, would that would count. Right. And as I say, for our annual review, we develop a document of what we've been doing the last 12 months. And I, we, there's a place in that review document, in that document for things like going to workshops. And so, you know, I've got the cold conference in, in the document. I actually run the database that keeps track of that for the school. So I'm sort of familiar with the process. But, uh, I'll agree. I think <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll go, I don't know, sorry. Uh, so, so just quickly, I think uh, every university or institution is gonna be a little bit different on how they count uh, all these things. So I would recommend everybody look at their particular institution and where these things would fit. But something that would be even more interesting would be um, to try to find out what institutions already have some of this in their language and maybe they can share with the OER community 
So, um, you know, if we begin some sort of repository of uh, tenure promotion statements being used at different universities, then other people who are looking into getting those into their university standards can look at similar university peer institution type places and see how those have been integrated. So maybe this could be an opportunity for all of us to collaborate um, in, in finding these statements and collecting them. I'll be happy to provide mine when we get it done. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, we are at time and I wanna say thank you all for attending, for being such active uh, participants in today. And thank you all to the facilitators for, uh, for being a part of this. It was really fun to put together. Yes, thank you all the facilitators. It was, it was great, so, all right. Everyone have a good rest of the day. Okay. Bye. Oops.